This week's Into the Wilderness podcast, it is the final shows from EWA, and uh, we had a lot of good feedback from the last show that was Davy Hughes. We did, and, and actually the one just before yeah. that too, which was for, from Tomo. I'm going to be giving, bringing you a little bit of news from Tomo, was it something that he fed to me just a couple of days ago, just in a moment. Yes, yeah, so it's been uh, really, really, really positive. What are we going to be talking about today, Joe? Um, we are going to talk a little bit about the Highland Stalker, a little bit about the Rigby trip that was at Blair Athol that we were involved in filming with, and we will also talk a bit about the trip where Corbett's rifle ended up in India, um, and we that's with Mark, and then with Lisa we talk a little bit about uh, her kind of early life and the conversation it was kind of just a, a general chat if I, remember I, right I actually least. do think she was a little bit hungover that morning do you think so <laughs> yeah definitely what, listening back to it no not, not listening back to it it's just that that she she's normally a lot more talkative than that <laughs> um, I do have to apologise it's not our fault but during both of the shows in the t- in fact I probably shouldn't say this to people because then they're going to listen for it but I'm going to I'm going to let you know anyway in the in the show with Mark, which is the first one, there is someone ferociously reloading a rifle in the background <laughs> for about ten <laughs> minutes of the interview, and I have no idea why. Uh, but that's you just what, hear them cycling. You, it. you can hear it cycling them over and At over. At least and it's over a again. nice cycle. It, it would is. be a rugby that was being cycled. <laughs> it was. It was a rugby, but I don't know anyone that's had to cycle a rifle that many times. And then we actually do explain in the back of the the one with Lisa, uh, we are sitting on the Browning stand and only like 10 meters away from us there was someone engraving the rifle so you mm. can hear like a ting 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 and you'll hear that but we do explain it during the show did they not start having a party halfway through that at well? the very end that ended the show they had uh, a party at the end of the show where there was like dances and someone was throwing a shotgun around and yeah it got a little bit crazy at the end but it was a good way to end all of the the podcasts because i think lisa was in fact the last show recorded yeah, it was, yeah. mm-hmm. um and Incidentally, we talked about the the trip to Svalbard and uh, talked about me going to see her in a few weeks' time. That's already all over with now. So uh, we've been to Svalbard. We've been to Svalbard. I've back. been to Norway, seen her. We've been there and back. Um, so yeah, it's been uh, we've done a lot. We've done a lot. Uh, but it's a really interesting show. It's, um, it's some funny bits with Mark. Um, you also learn about some uh, things about them trying to give money to charity as well, which is quite interesting. That's towards the end of the, the show. David Hughes references that two weeks ago, yep. what you're talking about. Yes, um, uh, Mark explains yeah. it a, a bit more um, with Rigby uh, raising money for uh, one of the national parks there for anti-poaching. But he, he'll go into it during during the show. So, so with, that is what is coming up. Before we get to that, we've got um, a couple of things to talk about. Uh, one uh, I'm just going to get over with now, which is what I referenced at the very start, was Tomo, our uh, guest from four weeks ago now, I think, um, messaged me two days ago and said, are you aware of what has been happening with African swine flu? Now, I remember having conversations with people probably about two years ago with regard to African swine flu making its way through Europe. Um, but he just told me that there has been a case which has been recorded in Hungary and so uh, and sent me a couple of links. So I started to read up about it, uh, exactly what it is. Essentially, it's um, an incredibly, um, incredibly powerful virus. It kills up to 90% of pigs um, which are infected with it. It causes massive internal bleeding and fluid on the lungs. To give you an idea of how hard it is to get rid of this, Spain had it in the 1950s. It took them 35 years to get rid of it. It's been recorded now in Poland, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, Russia, Romania, Czech Republic, and a whole heap that I haven't mentioned. So basically, Everywhere. Europe, it's coming. It's coming for us. Well, interestingly, but I haven't been able to actually confirm this solidly. I heard rumors that it was also in Germany. But, I mean, it, it's... It it makes perfect sense. Mm. Pigs don't. In fact, even if you did put up a physical border, pigs don't actually obey it. <laughs> well, they have a way of getting <laughs> yeah. underneath fences, don't they? Yeah. But the reason that we we bring it up on on this podcast, apart from just a bit of 
general knowledge of what is happening in the wider world is that it is incredibly easy to carry. Um, it's been known that um, mushroom pickers have taken it. It, it nasal secretions, feces, think foot and mouth if you're from the UK and you can remember back to foot and mouth when I was just looking at some pictures now of them burning all the bodies of domestic pigs. That's the first thing it made me think of, was when we had foot and mouth here. If people don't know what it is, because we've got a lot of... Um, well, some people will definitely know what it is, but we had a, a really bad case of foot and mouth uh, for the listeners that aren't within the 20 UK. Years ago? I think it must have been 20 years ago. And I remember driving... Well, I wasn't driving, I was very young at the time, down to the Lake District, and it was just field after field along the motorway with cows piled up, just burning. Yeah. It, I mean, it decimated... No, it's the, horrendous. The, the farming communities. But for hunters, um, blood is particularly infectious. So if you're a hunter and uh, you get blood on your clothes or it comes out the back of a pickup truck from an infected pig, you are going to be playing a role in helping that spread. So it's just awareness. If it's one of those countries, if you're in mainland Europe, basically read up on it and understand where it is and what you need to do, what pl- part you need to play in trying to ensure that it doesn't uh, spread any further. So thank you very much, Tomo, for bringing that to our attention. And if, I hope that our listeners... Um, well, you know what? I think that's probably what you're about uh, to if, say. If there is any other things like that that comes across uh, you, you, what you see in day-to-day life, it can be anywhere in the world, l- send us an email. Um, we'll do a little bit of research into it and we'll spread the word because the bottom line is is that the more people that are aware of things that are going on in the world, there is a chance that, one, something can be done by it, but secondly, you can reduce the risk of spreading it if you are travelling to these countries. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think hunters are going to play a really important role and, and I do hope that um, the different hunting organisations in these particular countries um, stand up and be responsible with regard to their advice because it, from what it sounds like and reads like to me is that uh, it, it's crucially important that people understand this. So uh, from that, moving on, we have our winner from two weeks ago which was to win a Hornady reloading manual, the latest edition. Uh, we've had uh, quite a lot of picture entries. It was to We wanted to see what spring was to you and uh, we had a picture... Which, um, from Andrew Wilson, which was, um, I'm going to give it to him because it wasn't really spring, but it was a picture of him standing beside a Reloading with Rosie a cutout, and of course it was the Hornady Reloading Manual that was up for grabs, so I thought that that was quite, that was quite smart, but thank you very much for everybody who entered a picture. It was nice to see what everyone else is uh, up yeah, to. Yeah, it was really, it's really cool actually because the, the spread was huge. You got uh, people in their fields uh, planting, and then you've got you know people doing walks and doing very robot stalking. Robot, yeah, so that it is quite varied throughout the country uh, what people are up to. Um, th- I think we already mentioned it before when we gave away free podcast stickers to all of our American listeners. Um, well, thank you again uh, from everyone from uh, the United States and Canada that emailed, and we had so many. I went to the post office. I've never posted that many things abroad before. No. Um, I think what we'll do, because we, we like sharing the love, is this time we're going to give away some podcast stickers, but you have to be from Europe. So if you are from Europe, mainland Europe, then send us a message and you can have a podcast sticker for free. Not uh, the UK, because not, we've already done a UK giveaway. Yeah, and we're also a way to leave Europe, European Union. So that <laughs> European Union countries that aren't leaving. This is our hand of friendship. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to give some podcast stickers away. Uh, no set number. It'll just be... We'll see first how, come first yeah, serve. Yeah, first come first serve. We'll see how inundated we'll see, we'll Yeah, like, like though in the US, we cut it off very quickly because we got that many... Mm-hmm. Um, emails through uh, but we still sent out a lot of uh, stickers but anyway I, I know we've got a huge amount of listeners um, in uh, Sweden Norway and uh, Denmark uh, where else we've got some good it's listeners mainly the Nordic countries mainly Nordic, Germany yeah the Germans like to if you if you speak German so they're, they're sometimes a bit iffy that's what we were told <laughs> even though you can all speak English so we have another competition uh, on top of our giveaway uh, which is we're actually going to run, not uh, over the over the internet like we normally do, which is essentially how you enter these competitions. Uh, but as our regular listeners will know, we are going to be at the Northern Shooting Show uh, next weekend. So the yeah, not this 12th weekend. And 13th. So not the weekend that the podcast comes out. The weekend after so 12th is, and 13th yeah, of May. Yeah, there we go. Uh, if you're not going, you should be. 
especially if you're from the UK. I know there's some people actually flying, flying in from in. various parts yep. of the world come as well. Got we got well, I think we said it before. South Africa and Denmark. We know we've got people coming in from. Yeah, we do, and um, Cyprus as well, I believe. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you have it. So, so yeah, there there are people from all over all over the world going, and uh, I know a huge number of people from the UK who are going. So, get yourself to the Northern Shooting Show if you're not. But if you want to uh, have a chance of winning this week's competition, you're going to have to be at the Northern Shooting Show uh, because we are going to be giving away. Um, Tipton uh, reloading rod, uh, reloading rods, Tipton cleaning rods, and they're uh, carbon fiber. They're quite cool. And uh, Tipton gun vices, so for for cleaning your gun, so that you can it, it holds your rifle without damaging the stock. I'm sure you've all seen them before. We'll stick up some pictures on social media so you can have a look. And we are going to require you. What are we going to ask people to do? Come uh, and find us for a start. Well, you need to come and find us, and this is going to be to only people that have that have got podcast stickers so if you're at the show and you've got it on your card just take a snap of yeah, your maybe your ticket beside the podcast sticker or something. no or it was gonna well, pull, it's probably gonna be on their car yeah it? it wouldn't be yeah so take a picture of it of on the on your back of your car or if you're not taking that vehicle to the show take a snap of your vehicle with uh, the podcast sticker and uh we'll you can win. It's, it's first, first, come, it's first, first come first serve. I think we've got. And if you are going to the show and you don't have a podcast sticker, there is still time to order one and get it to you in time. If you will, I mean, I, I think what I would accept is if you listen to the podcast and you come to the tent, which we're going to be by the symposium area, uh, which is just off the main drag, and you go and buy a sticker and say, oh, "Hang on, I'm also a podcast listener, so now I've got a sticker." I think we will accept that. Yeah, we will accept that because we will have podcast stickers <laughs> for sale along with all the rest of the stuff from our shop and our tent. So there'll, there'll be a few ways to there'll be a few ways to win, but uh, that, it's important that you you come and tell us. I'm entering the competition. Do you have any of these left? Because I think I've got a cleaning rod at my house, so maybe we can There's take two, three cleaning rods, and two gun vices. Well, there we go. So there you go. Five opportunities to win. I've just made biltong at my house for the first time. There was, you had a lot of comments on uh, of jealous was, people on Instagram. I it wasn't Instagram; it was just Facebook. No, I just, it wasn't even a good picture. I just snapped like I. It was really dark because it was late at night. I hung up my meat, and uh, I don't think I've ever had that much interaction on <laughs> on a, a post before. And uh, what happened the week before? I went into. Um, I tried to get some. This is how crazy. This is how crazy this country is. Uh, it was a really warm weekend. I think a week ago, and everyone must have been barbecuing. And I went into the first store to get some meat. First of all, I tried to go to the butcher. That was closed because it was a Sunday. So I was like, I want to get some meat. So I went into another store. There was not one ounce of meat left on the shelves because of the everyone's barbecue. And the only thing they le- had left was the big joints of roasting, roasting. Um, what do you call them? Uh, like a roasting joint. Roasting joint. So I bought two of those and I thought, I'll just slice them up. really, And it actually worked really well having a big joint that you could say slice because that's what they would do at the butcher. They would cut you long, yeah. thin strips anyway. Um, so I did that and I tasted my first piece last night and it tastes bloody good. The only thing I would say is I don't think I put enough salt in it. It's the first time is it I, as good as mom's. No, it's not because she's had years and years and years of, <laughs> of, of perfecting it. But, um, this is the first time I've ever made built on on my own in my own house. And so I've got the built on box and everything, but it is fantastic. The one thing I would say is you really underestimate how much coriander you need. So I need to buy like a bag of two kgs or three sack. kgs, a sack of coriander, and then also some salt and uh, pepper. But yeah, no, I think I think the first batch is. I mean, the bottom line is is that I could probably eat dried meat with no. Um, I could fill no my boots with that every day of the year. The, I had dried moose heart for the first time oh, uh, right. when when I was in Norway. It was beautiful, and the more beers you had, the more the, it went down faster. Uh, no, it was it's sal- a little bit like built around the campfire, isn't it? It's salted. It was a salted uh, moose heart, and it was absolutely brilliant. It ba- it actually looked like when they shaved biltong, low into like super thin, into really thin slices, yeah. and it was super um, super moist, and they just had like. Th- not, I don't know. It wasn't really fat, but it had like. Well, maybe no. You could you could try some road deer heart in your biltong box. I don't see why not. I mean, I had a few people message me asking if I tried pheasant or partridge, and I don't see any reason why. I mean, they they make everything into biltong in Africa, so Pretty much, yeah. there's no reason why we should pheasant, maybe we'll try some this season. Pheasant and partridge wouldn't work either. Even even rabbit would probably. I bet work. you pigeon would work. Well. Pigeon would work. It's I guess the only thing is. 
I mean, it wouldn't be that, that I think, much work. I think if you were doing rabbit, you'd want pretty thin strips that yeah, dried up would. quickly. Because the rabbit stinks. <laughs> yeah, I know. So as much problem. as I like eating it, the thing that I have find with rabbit is that if I've cleaned a whole bunch of rabbit for the freezer or the fridge, I don't really feel like eating it that day because you can't <laughs> get the smell off your hands. I mean, you can wear gloves, but you always have it like clinging on your clothes. I always need like a day or two between sorting out rabbits and actually eating them. Uh, but share your recipes with us, your wild recipes, especially dried and cured food. I like dried and cured food. I, th- I find it interesting what different cultures do. I well, Yeah, it's it's true. I mean, you, when I was having the, the Norwegian stuff, it tastes completely different to anything mm. that I've I've had here, but they're very much into their, their drying out of not just meat. Well, it is meat, but fish as well, fish and... You've just reminded me. that we, I can't remember what it was called, but when we were in Svalbard, we had that rehydrated cod. It's called kipfish. Kipfish, yeah. So they dry it. They they dry it out to to cure it and so that they can keep it for a long period of time. And then it's rehydrated and then cooked with this really creamy. Really, a bit, it was like Fantastic. really like salty, but also like fresh tasting. But I think it has to be like it's almost instantaneous. So it's like within thirty minutes, it's processed. And mm. um, I actually managed to bring back a bunch of cod from Norway. Did you? Yeah, I did. Um, they. They felt sorry for us how small our fish were. Honestly, those fillets that they gave me were the biggest fillets I've ever had. You cannot go into a store here and buy a piece of cod that size that they get over there. I don't really understand why we don't have the cod sizes here. Do you think it's the fish, the, the food source? I think it's partly the food source and overfishing it's, in the sea as it's well. It's only just across the ocean. Yeah. Uh, There's probably somebody who's... Uh, a seasoned or used to be a seasoned fisherman off the east coast of Scotland here who can tell us what has happened to the the fish stocks over the last 30 40 years yeah, but I, I know I, that I, particularly cod they they're they're back on the up but they had massive declines and most of like, that was overfishing was there a time here it's definitely not been in my lifetime that we used to have cod like they did in Norway or has it never been the case we've never had those size fish we've never had the numbers we well, need to look into that so if anyone knows, let us know, because that would be quite intriguing. I think we intriguing. had good numbers, but I just don't know about the sizes. Yeah, it would be interesting Because everything out. seems to be a big cod. Yeah, in every, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Everything's big. Um, I, I, swear there was a, I swear there was something else I had to uh, uh, comment on. But I'm no. not, I wasn't sure. I, I'm getting my knee fixed you, you, fixed tomorrow. You need well, to write things down, though. I know, but I, I edit the show, and it's uh, I, it, I like to just do things off the top of my head. Um, I'm, I'm getting operated on tomorrow when I record this, which is actually yesterday when it comes out. This is what happens when you record a podcast at different times. You time travel. <laughs> um, so hopefully I'll have a new knee by uh, the time this is, comes out. You're not. You're, you're making it sound a little bit like that you're having a knee replacement, but you're not quite. Um, you've got it, lots my, of debris. My, my in knee your leg. isn't being replaced, but it will feel like a new knee hopefully. once it's done because it is. Um, yeah, I would like to be able to kneel on my knee again. Which is quite nice. Did you know as well? If you don't use your knee, uh, I, I'm I'm walking and everything fine, but I don't, I can't kneel on my knee. And there's one thing that you learn when you lose uh, the ability to do something is how much you actually have to do that. So kneeling is actually quite an important thing for day to day life. Mm. You know, a simple things. You drop something, you kneel down, or you want to get under the car, or you know, things like that. And because I can't kneel on my knee, it's really hairy. It's like four or five <laughs> times hairier than my other knee. <laughs> well, the thing is, I, suppose, I never really thought about this. Yeah. If you do look at the hair on your knee, it's always bristly, right? Yeah, because it's worn down yeah, because yeah. you kneel on it. So, and you're quite hairy anyway, yeah. so you've found some of the so my, on my, your knee. My, you? my right knee, <laughs> I could actually straighten the hair on my left <laughs> knee now. It's disgusting. I know it's disgusting, but it's it's one of those weird side effect things, isn't it? You don't I'm, use your knee and you get it goes I bet hairy. you didn't think when you tuned into the podcast you were going to hear about hairy knees. No. <laughs> uh, as a as a, a complete um, detraction from Daryl's hairy knees, in about four weeks' time, I'm going to New Zealand. I am not. Sadly, Daryl's not. He was supposed to be because, because I've got because I've got hairy knees. Because of his uh, hairy recovering knees, he's uh, not coming. But I'm going to be going to New Zealand. I'm going to be with um, a gentleman called Joseph Peters from Hard Yards Hunting. If you go and check out Hard Yards Hunting on Facebook or Instagram, you'll be able to see the kind of stuff that he gets up to and the kind of stuff I'm going to be getting up to when I'm over there. I'm really... Well, I haven't had that much time to think about it because we've had so much going on recently, but I'm just starting to get in the zone now. I'm thinking about the clothes that I'm going to take and what I'm going to be packing and how to strip down the camera gear. 
So there will be, um, there's going to be a film output from this, which is actually going to be, um, I've just had confirmed the other day that w that is going to be loaded straight to our YouTube channel. We have barely put anything on, on our, our YouTube yep, channel. It is, yeah. Dal didn't even know that. Nah. So our uh, Into the Pace Brothers, Into the Wilderness We should YouTube really channel. do like an update video on that, just to let everyone know we're not actually dead. Like the channel's not shut down. It's just that we've been making films for other people for two years. Yeah. Um, but this is, I mean, we're not going to be in this because I need to film it and Daryl's not there. Uh, but it, so it's going to be about Joseph. Uh, but we're, it's going to be on our channel. And it's going to be very similar to the sort of uh, feel and, and ethic of a lot of the other films that we've made. So I'm, I'm quite excited about the prospect of actually presenting what kind of one of our films again yeah. um, to everybody. So that's going to be exciting. And of course, there'll be lots of pictures and I will try my best to... I'm not quite as good as Daryl is at keeping everybody updated on social media, but I will do my best to make sure that I'm posting where and when I can. I just remember what I was going to say. I it's, it's been it's actually been crazy the last few months for us. Um, last week was kind of a, a blur for me because I I started going into like early morning and night shift mode. Um, I was doing some really really cool stuff with the German Game Conservancy. Uh, up in the the northeast of Scotland, and it's basically the first time that it's ever been used. But I've been using a, th a thermal camera on the bottom of a drone for looking at wildlife, but in particular waders, waders, grouse, um, and it worked. It w it took us a while to figure out how exactly it could be used, but we were getting to the point where we could identify nests very easily within very large valleys um, and I could even ID how many eggs were in the nest and it, yeah so it's a pretty cool project that we're working on and I hopefully will see some output from it at some point uh, I'm not I think it's a, it's a many years project that's going on yeah three or four years so it's it's Pretty super cool. interesting. Though. It's super interesting, and I, I would love to know how this kind of technology could be used for other conservation uh, projects. I mean, the the wages thing is a big thing right now, so it'd be pretty cool to see it being used a little bit more in these kind of ways. Yeah. Right. Is that us? Yeah, I think I think we're well, that's it. Well, so make sure you come and see us, Northern Shooting Show. Yeah, Northern Shooting Show. Less than two weeks from when this podcast goes up. We mentioned it, I think, two weeks ago, but as well as where we're going to be with our tent, there's going to be a massive symposium area and debates happening on the hour every every hour. Debates and discussions, and um, there's going to be uh, I think Thomas Jacks are going to be there, and they're going to be showing and demoing some equipment with. Um, you're actually going to be able to see like the output from thermal and and. Probably well, not night vision because it's going to be during the day, but outputs from thermal on a on a big screen, and there's going to be individual discussions and panel debates and stuff throughout all of the Saturday and Sunday. So uh, it's going to be it's going to be the whole show is going to be great because we know what it's been like from the previous years. But this is brand new. This has never been it done is. before. The, show, uh, the, so. the team at the Northern Shooting Show every year they they really do improve on it and we can see the amount of work that just goes into it. It's going to be a really good show. We can't wait to see everyone there. Um, please stop in and see us. We're going to have coffee on all day long, although yeah. we will be asking for a small donation for the coffee, and I'm talking small, anything you want. Yeah, whatever's uh, in your pocket. Whatever's in your pocket. It's going to go all go towards um, Woodcock Research for the GWCT. Yeah. So that's that's the, the plan, but we'll also have our other stuff to purchase. But also, more importantly, it, it, not really the purchasing, it's just coming to see us, coming chill out have a chat and uh we love to speak to people so we absolutely will and when the next podcast goes out we will also be able to tell you if you won't don't know already from following us on social media who the winners are of our dna film festival the first hunting film festival to be held in the uk it's it's crazy and if if you ever thought about getting into um i was gonna say photography but it's film uh, maybe we can bring photography into it the following year hmm Maybe that would be a good plan. Um, there, the prizes that are in this would make you want to at least try and take up the take up doing. And really, there's an amateur and professional. So even at, at an amateur level with a basic camcorder or even a GoPro, you could probably make a good film if you think about it. For us, and and you'll see this if you go and visit the website, uh, thepacebrothers.com and you click the DNA Film Festival, you'll see like what the ethos of the film festival is. And for us, it's about great storytelling. And if you've got a great story to tell, you don't need a £30,000 red camera 
to tell it. No. Um, you know, it's just a, a good eye, a sympathetic eye to what you're trying to capture and tell good stories. Because in actual fact, and we, we've said this before, is you can have really fancy gear and you can make a three, four minute music video, essentially, of hunting, where someone sticks a soundtrack underneath and they put a lot of pretty, pretty imagery on top. Any, that is not a, a good film. Anyone can do that. Anyone can do it. So we want we want good stories, and, and we have them because we have all the entrants. Uh, I've got the last film that's being entered. There's been a lot of entrants. It's yeah, it's it's going to be a a tough one actually calling who's who's winning. Yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to people the people have put us in a bit of a predicament <laughs> because we would actually like to give more people prizes than we c- can actually give. We were literally having a discussion <laughs> the other day. It was like. These people all deserve something. They all do deserve but not something. Not everybody can have, you know, not everybody can be a winner. No. Nah. Uh, but anyway, you will hear about that. We'll, we're going to try and, I think we'll try and bring you a podcast um, somewhat related to the DNA Film Festival. And in just f- like f- five days' time, Tyler Sharp, the man behind Modern Huntsman, is going to be sitting probably exactly where I'm sitting right now in the office. And we're going to be recording a podcast with him. The Modern Huntsman has been going out of the shop here. Uh, as far faster, faster actually than we, than we can, can stop. Yeah, it. we are. In fact, I'm after we f- we hit the the off button on this. I'm probably away to order another. I think hundred or two hundred coming in, because people are buying them so fast. Um, Which is great. Yeah, it's amazing. We're, it really we're massive. We've been behind it since well since it before it even existed in print form, and uh, we're both very excited to have Tyler here and talk about his plans for the future as well so if you have any questions we might even do a little live video or something when he comes next week or something yeah we'll try and do that uh, we'll try and do it and uh if you have any questions for him shoot, shoot us over a message and i just thought of something because uh we had somebody order one of the modern huntsmans a couple of days ago and they wanted uh, us to sign it and i sent them an email and said you know if if you want to hold on or hold off a week we've got them in stock tyler sharp's going to be here i will get it signed for you so if you don't already have a copy and you want to order a copy, uh, I can get Tyler Sharp to sign it. Yeah, but you. But you it would have to be in the next couple of days. One, so. you have to order in the next few days, and secondly, it's first come first serve because I'm looking at the, the our modern huntsmen that are in stock right now, and uh, judging by the rate that they're going at, it's not going to last very long. No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, if you want, if you want us to do that, it is no problem. Just leave a leave it in the comments section when you place the order for a magazine. In fact, we sh- we might, maybe we could just get him to sign the lot of those. Yeah, okay. We can get him to sign what we have here, uh, yeah. but still, first come, first serve. Yeah, once, exactly. once, the pl- <laughs> once the pile's gone, then it's gone. We'll yeah. do that when he arrives. Yeah, okay. Off. Well, we're going to let you crack on with the show. It's a uh, great show, and uh, we'll join us again in two weeks' time. Mark, I can't believe that 12 months has passed since I sat in this exact sofa and you sat exactly there at Iwa and we were talking about the launch, the launch yeah. of the Highland Stalker. 12 months has passed. You've had some an amazing uptake on it. You've done some fantastic adventures with it and we're actually looking at a film of one of the big uh, sort of releases this year at Blair Athol's just playing above us as we're doing this interview. What has it been like releasing the Highland Stalker last year to where we're sitting today 12 months later it's a, a roller coaster i think is the only way you can really des- describe it but it's uh, it, it's been an amazing 12 months um, the, the whole concept of the Highland Stalker was you know it was in our head for uh, you know the first couple of years after we returned Rigby to the UK and we'd spent 3 years developing it to get exactly you know get the rifle we wanted and to see it realized and then in the marketplace and, the, and it's been great at the show here people coming up going oh my god that's the Highland Stalker yeah i saw that uh, like in uh, awe yeah in awe of this thing and, in, and to see uh, something from you know, cons- you wake up in the morning and you're thinking about it to a piece of metal and, and wood on a on a rack here at Ewers. Pretty crazy. No, I, I, it's one of the questions that we get asked quite a lot whenever we put up the odd picture uh, where the Highland Stalker appears in it. You always get questions. What is that? Yeah. If they don't know already. Yeah, yeah, and it, but it, but it's one of those sort of you know classic. Um, oh, 
someone's phone there. Uh, yeah. Daryl, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Podcast, <laughs> not turning off his phone. <laughs> no, it's you know, it's 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 a classic look, and I think if you looked at that rifle fifty yards away, you would know it's a Rigby. You know, yeah. it lo- it has that silhouette. It looks like a Rigby. Um, you know, and and and. I think whenever we've tried to be clever at Rigby's um, and we've tried to change things, it doesn't work. If you just stick with exactly, it's like the new, well, I don't want to, uh, well, Land Rover Defender. Yes, it's I mean, fine, you can uh, do I just that. said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, who knows? Maybe the new shape, people won't like it. But fingers people, crossed, fingers they, cro- stay. <laughs> yeah. they stay true to their origins. <laughs> yeah, but the, you know, the, the, that classic design, and that's you know what we've done with um, all of the rifles that have done well for us at Rigby's, we've just you know, essentially copied what the company did a century ago, and it's what people want, and that's why they buy into the brand. Mm. And what was, explain this adventure that's play, they're playing above us here, in Blair Athol, there's which, been a lot of articles when, about when it. You, obviously, we, we did the, the whole week, and then you know, sit back the, the following week and you reflect on what <laughs> what you just did. It was an incredible thing to pull off. Well, it, it, yeah, explain you, like how that, like how did, the, where was the seed? I think like all, all great British uh, ideas, it started down the pub. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Simon and I, after a couple of beers, and we said, you know, like, I find we'd, we'd already launched this big game rifle and the big game rifle, um, we, we, we brought it out uh, to, you know, relaunch the company and build a bit of trust there with customers that, would, you know, let's be honest, that had been lost after what happened in America. So, but the, the big game um, rifle and the whole story that goes with it, it's very romantic. It, you know, it's Africa, it's Dennis Finch Hatton, you know, with Karen Von Blixen in Kenya, it, you know, and people buy into that. Now, if we just launched a small caliber rifle, well, you need a story behind it. It needs a, the rifle needs a personality. And so a heart. Yeah. It needs a heart, exactly. Yeah. So, my experience, and, and I've hunted in Scotland, you know, much of my life, and absolutely adore the place. But whenever you go around the world, there's a real affinity for Scotland and the Scottish Highlands. And looking back at, um, you know, the uh, uh, you know the, the, the rifles that we made of yesteryear, they were produced for you know Scottish stalking. So we had this rifle, we had the identity, and you know Simon Barr, who's done a phenomenal job with our marketing at Rigby's. M- many people out there will know who I'm talking about. Um, if Simon comes to you and says he's had a good idea, it means it probably just cost, you know, 10, 15 grand. <laughs> <laughs> that was just coming up with the idea. Yeah, that's just coming up with the idea. No, and Simon said, look, yeah, you know, I think in the UK, the um, shooting or uh, country pursuits is probably the last retreat for the Edwardian lady and gentleman. You know, it's the last place where you can hark back to those old older times. And Simon said, what about doing a Victorian-styled um you know, escape to the highlands with the the sleeper train, and that's that fantastic old painting going north, and and the, and then the ideas started. You know, as as the as the beers came in, the ideas got better and better and better, and and, it, and bigger, bigger and yeah. more expensive actually. But, <laughs> <laughs> but and it, and it turned into this huge thing. And you guys did a fantastic job up there. You came up there and and, and filmed it, and that film I'm sure will be online very soon. For uh, it was a what. pleasure. I thoroughly enjoyed being yeah, part of that experience. Pretty yeah, special, yeah, definitely, to be yeah. there as filmmakers and just experience it. And I know that there's companies out there that offer similar uh, experiences um, with with Highland uh, shooting um, tra- trains. So you know, you get on a train, you you move over, you know piece of ground and shooting on different estates over different days but you know I'm not aware of any gun makers uh, laying on something quite like this and it was you know we're gun makers we're not tour operators we <laughs> yeah. learn uh, you know <laughs> it's sort of serene swans on the surface and paddling underneath but it, it was an amazing experience and, and we've got people um, you know, sent letters to us and emails of guys who'd been to a lot of different um, media launches, uh, rifle uh, and, and gun launches around the world. You know, media guys um, who'd said, "Look, this really was one of the greatest uh, events I've ever been on." You really? Know? Yeah. Honestly. I mean, I, I say that like I'm surprised. I'm not surprised. Yeah, we're, we're not surprised. I, I know that the you know some some of the people who are on this journey and they are well travelled hunters who have hunted around the world so for them to say that and it's kind of on our back door you're down south it's literally on our back door and sometimes we take that for granted but it Definitely. is incredible it, it is and you, you know i remember being 10 years old and saying to my my father who uh, who owns a house in scotland now and um, he adores the place and i said what, what is it about the highlands and he said one day you'll see it and, we, and you know went up there stalking for the first time and it just blew me away and it does every time i go up there now as you say, it's in our backyard, so we're used to seeing it. But you can imagine, you know, f- you know, Phil Mazzaro, wherever he is right yeah. now. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good old Phil. You know, you know, a, you know, American hunter. He's been to some incredible places, but you know, seeing the Highlands for the first time on that experience. I mean, it's you know, once in a lifetime stuff. Yeah, yeah. I can only the only way that because I, I was born there and grown up with it. The only way I can compare it for me 
was the first time I truly got to hunt Africa. But it must be like that for people who have never been to Scotland. So. It must yeah. be like there, that. You know, there's some, um, there's some great places around the world to hunt, but I think Africa and Scotland are probably two of the r- most romantic. You, you probably know. overloaded people there because, you know, they're getting off the train, there's bad pipes playing. Next thing, now they're, they're in the highlands shooting a deer, then, then you've got a castle, and then it's yep. just it, the whole experience is, was just but into... And and when we wanted to keep it as secret as possible, so it was you know a lot of sort of oh, wow. We factors. were sworn yeah. to secrecy. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and and throughout the the whole week, and you know, so we had the uh, the going up on the train, staying in the lodge, and then of course the black tie dinner at Blair Castle, which was just spectacular in that in that. Do hall explain there. that room for people who haven't been there. It, it's impossible. If you can. I mean, there's two rooms. You go into the um, the sort of the lobby, and they have the arms and armor of the Athol Highlanders, and there's I mean, there's everything from crossbows oh, to it's everything. It's I think just, the first. Air rifle was even the, yeah, it's an order. extraordinary place, uh, and you sort of you're blown away, and then you walk down a, a corridor with I don't know what was there a hundred I don't know fifty hundred stag heads it's on incredible. the wall. Incredible, either side, either side, yeah. dating back to you know sort of 1850, I think some of them, and they're all dated. And then you go into this gymnasium. It's the only way you can describe it. It's a, it's a sort of banquet hall, but it it looks like a gym da- gymnasium because it's got a wooden floor, which yeah. I found out was for it was built by one of the dukes for uh, Highland dancing. Specifically, F- specifically, uh, and, I didn't and, know that. Yeah, no, I know it's interesting, but it um, and it's an incredible place. And there's sort of, um, well, I suppose you're going to d- describe it, spoils of war on the walls, you know, from the different dukes coming back from dip- different campaigns, and they've got the chainmail, chainmail yeah. from and things from you know Turkey. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary room. Uh, so we had a table, uh, you know, laid out, black tie function. Everybody was piped into dinner. We had the piper. And I think the first group, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the media group who, who came came through. I mean, no one spoke for five minutes when no. they sat down. The bagpipes stopped, and people were like jaws open, phones out, taking pictures. Yeah, it was. Uh, Phil was actually who we just mentioned earlier. He was actually drooling over your middle yeah. table. <laughs> yeah, so we explained the middle table because that was. I mean. I've never seen a collection of guns like that in one place at one time. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talked before about the Blair Athol collection, but, you know, Rigby's, um, it was very important when we brought the company back that we would rebuild our, um, you know, our archives and, and a collection, we call it the museum, the Rigby Museum, but a collection of period uh, Rigby rifles and shotguns. Um, and we've got everything in there from 275 lightweight models to pre-war 416s to double rifles to Jim Corbett's 275 and we had much of this laid out in the middle of the banquet table um, I don't know there was probably one or two million pounds worth of vintage Rigby's laid there and everyone had dinner around, around them, around and, them and yeah. it was you know it it's proper. This it's is like my a jo- homage to the. Yeah, I mean, look, this is my job, yeah. but uh, we do some pretty cool stuff at Rigby's, and and it's afforded me some amazing opportunities, and and you know that's something that's a definite career highlight in that venue as well. Mm. Yeah, no, it. Uh, I I will, even though it is literally just over the hill, I, that experience, just filming it will forever live with me. Yeah, Blair Athol just has some of the most stunning scenery when you start going around that that estate. It, even. Even for that area, it's quite unique. I, I don't know. It's it's hard to describe it until is, you go yeah, there. Yeah, it, it is, and it, and it's vast as well, yeah, isn't it? It it's is a huge, oh, huge place, and and you've got these amazing people working the ground there. Who you know, they they know those hills like the back of their hand, and you know, you, well, you, if you watch the video, you can pick up on a little bit of it. But you know, looking at Right, the weather's blowing in from this direction today, so the deer are going to be in here, and you know, it just comes from decades and decades of experience with those guys. And it was a, it was a pleasure. They did, they did us proud. They, uh, I mean, the whole the whole week was just fantastic. One of the other beautiful things, and there's there are no, a few estates around Scotland that still do this, but on some of the beats, the opportunity to go stalking and take a stag off with a garran is just. It's incredible. like that extra that, for me. It's thing, like the yeah. pinnacle of stag hunting. It, it, it is, and. You know, I think in the UK, we're very fortunate in the UK with the access we have to deer stalking. Many of us shoot, you know, a, you know, quite a lot of deer in yeah. a year, but it becomes a little bit of a sort of meat collection exercise. You know, you Fill shoot, yeah, yeah, you shoot it, you put it in the back of the vehicle, you take it home, it goes in the chiller. You know, th- there's something so so special, and just makes an occasion of it. You know, and and the respect for the beast. You know, it's and we we sometimes I think we're a little bit guilty of f- forgetting that, and um, you know, honouring the beast, and you you put him up on the up on the the Garen pony and you, you walk it down. It's just, it, it, it's such an uh, affordable day out. I mean, what is it? They're five six hundred pounds to shoot a stag. Something in that region. Yeah, People that think region. it's like uh, it, astronomical, it, yeah, but it, it really it's, isn't. It's not expensive for a day out. For you know, and you, quite often you're, you you know you got a nice you know 
you know set of antlers that you might put up on the wall or you know it, you, you might be lucky one day and the next day you don't get something quite as special but it's all about managing the herd up there um but you know what what you're actually getting for your money is just incredible you know you've got two guys who are entertaining you for the whole day then you've got the pony and the the sta- you know it's, it's a fantastic experience and if you haven't done it I, anyone out there i strongly recommend it yeah no we, we always say to people who enjoy stalking and have maybe even experienced the highlands that you need to go and experience that kind of stalk. Yeah, on yes. an old estate with the, with the heritage and everything that comes with it, and try and take a stag off with a pony. Yeah, and I, I remember, you know, when I shot my first stag, um, I was I don't know, 13, 14 years old, something like that. And, it, and my father said to me something then, and, it, and it, I stand by it today. The, the the day is the trophy. Forget the word trophy. I mean, the, the, I don't know a better word for it. But you know, people go up there expecting, who may go up there expecting to shoot a huge. You know, uh, you know, fourteen pointer. It, it's not about that. The day is the is the is the. It's all That's about the, prize, the experience, isn't it? Yeah, and and managing the herd. You know, shooting the older um, animals or the you know the, the weaker animals, and and that's what it's all about. And coming back. Um, soaking wet usually even if it's dry you end up getting soaking wet <laughs> up there. Yeah. Cool. that's just Scotland isn't <laughs> yeah. It? Yeah. cooling about and you know getting back you know boots on the radiator get a gin and tonic on the go and sitting by the fire and it's just fantastic you know, sharing stories it's you know I think it's one of the most underrated sporting destinations in the world and I've been very fortunate to hunt on several continents and been all to lots of different places but I think Scotland is still I mean yeah it's right up there it right is up there. no I- Anybody who hasn't been, you got to do it. Uh, it. Connected to the Highland Stalker, but I only just watched this last week, which was the the full film that's on your the Rigby YouTube channel, which t- talks about taking uh, the, the Corbett's rifle back to India. Yes. So, I mean, for anybody who hasn't seen that, go onto the Rigby YouTube channel and watch it. But we talked a little bit about it last time because of the the tie in with the Highland Stalker but what an incredible story that was i was the, the one bit that really got me was uh, your face when you put uh, jim's <laughs> rifle back in the yeah. cupboard where uh, it belonged you, you, you mean when i'm looking ill <laughs> <laughs> were you were you suffering like? oh uh, you, i mean i've been to india so. <laughs> just what, the, like buckets of sweat coming off as it was i thought it was just hot it, it was that as well but i mean yeah as I, as i said a little bit earlier you know, rigby has afforded all of the people uh, that work for the company some incredible opportunities you know and the jim corbett rifle is a story that just keeps on giving and uh, to have the opportunity to take it back to india that the last time that rifle was in india was 1947 Okay, Corbett then goes to Kenya. So the first night, it was, it was like it was written in the stars. Simon and I turn up with the with the the gang of Rig, of, of Corbett scholars and other uh, members of the the media community, and we we're in this camp and and everyone's oh, oh, oh I want to you know everyone's fighting for a tent and the guy comes out and says well we actually have two Mishans in the jungle and if anyone would like the opportunity to sleep in the Mishan, let me know. No one wanted to do it, but Simon and I, oh my. God, you know, yeah. definitely. And yeah. so the first night that that rifle, the Jim Corbett 275, was back in India, we were in a Mashan with it, in the jungle, listening to leopards calling up oh. in the foothills of the Himalayas. I mean, it's just, you know. You couldn't write that in a story book. No, and it, it proper, you know, proper you know, life stuff, you know. And we, so we, that was it coming home. <laughs> that was it coming home, and, we, and, and we're such geeks as well. We sat there reading <laughs> under, like, Jim you know, Corbett. Yeah, Jim Corbett, under like, your mobile phone yeah. light, and the, the, the great story of the Ruda Prague man-eating leopard when he shoots it from the uh, the mango tree and, and you know we visited that exact place later on in the trip but we were trying to work out you know when he turns the torch on and then we start we sat there reenacting how did he do it how, yeah yeah how he did it and, and uh, you know trying to work out whether he could see it in the dark and you know, real geek stuff I mean <laughs> it's our job but we love it <laughs> so it is uh, for anyone who hasn't read Jim's books you go and pick up a copy and I actually have a rather special collection of Jim's books because they are the reprints the Rigby that my girlfriend bought me but that was uh, there's a great story there to be told as well because that money went to well, well that you was, can explain that, that yeah that was really the whole purpose of the trip of course um taking the rifle back was a great story but we really just used that to highlight uh tiger conservation now you know we produce a lot of dangerous game rifles and deer stalking rifles but you know, rigby um is, is very much about conservation and we and it, we hold it very close to our hearts and we felt that reacquiring jim corbett's rifle it had to be commemorated in some way and uh it, to you know the easy option would have been to look to to name the highland stalker the jim corbett model but i think that would have been entirely wrong for corbett's memory this is a man who didn't hunt for profit 
Um, he, he loved and cared for the local people. In fact, he built a, a village there, Choti Helwani, which he, even when he moved to Kenya, was paying the land taxes. Wow, you know, I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, and he's he, he, amazing, amazing guy. So we did two things. We made the, the SCI Corbett commemorative rifle, which raised a quarter of a million dollars for conservation projects around the world and set the world record. I mean, that's another... That room must have been <laughs> buzzing. I yeah, actually I, saw a clip of that the other day, and it just looked electric. Yeah, when I mean, it's like, I think it's like when you win the Super Bowl or something. Yeah. It was like 4,000 uh, uh, Americans in this room. Uh, uh, I mean, it got a standing ovation. It was electric, the atmosphere. And the SCI president came running up to the stage and said, yeah, you guys did it. You <laughs> did it. Just unbelievable. And, I, I, you know, when the hammer went down, I couldn't even rem I couldn't wasn't really aware of what price it had sold for. You know, it was just, it, uh, you know. Very, very emotional. But, you know, that was a great way of using Corbett's, um, you know, legacy, I suppose, to, you know, to help. And also the books that you talked about before, uh, we produced uh, 275 sets of his books wrapped in Rigby blue leather with the logo and a new do, forward. Do you know what number you've got? I don't have number 275. Nah, uh, no. It's quite an early number I have. I can't I, remember. I'm the MD. Like I wasn't even allowed number <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got like 62 or something. <laughs> um, no, so we, and we, 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 there are still a couple available if anybody out there oh, would like, brilliant. like I said, um, we, we, we donated, uh, well, all of the sale value of those books and then some to the Jim Corbett National Park. Now, rather than turning up there with one of those sort of big novelty checks and <laughs> handing it over, we, um, uh, we thought, well, how would the money be best spent? And we thought an anti-poaching vehicle. So we contacted uh, the, the Jim Corbett National Park. We arranged everything. And so the rifle being there was really just, you know, to, to, to give the whole thing a bit of... Um, you know, glamour Give you a journey there as well. Yeah, yeah. as well, and, and and we were in you know fifty national newspapers um, with this trip, and we made the donation, and that that vehicle still there, and it was kitted out for um, you know uh, veterinary work for you know rapid response oh, if right. there's a wounded okay. animal. So, you know, which I think is great, you know, and, and and it's you know we can't hunt in India anymore, but there's that doesn't mean that conservation doesn't need you know it, more than ever it needs to go. Supported, on. Yeah, it? and the, the the poaching there is rife, and it's it's, it's pretty sad, sad story. So. Um, no, we 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 um, yeah, hold hold the whole story very close to our hearts, and yeah, was, uh, I love the I love the story, and yeah, the, everyone listening needs to go go watch the story so they can get a snippet of what it was like to take that take that particular and then buy the back. books before they're gone. Well, yeah, well, tell me what was also interesting on that point is uh, we we contacted um, when we contacted the park, they they said, well, we can do this, but it has to go through a charity. So we contacted WWF the. The, the, you know the wildlife yeah. guys, not the wrestling guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just up, in case there's any. Yeah, I grew up when it was WWF. I think it's yeah. WWE now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we contacted them, and you know they wouldn't receive our donation because we make hunting rifles, which really? I think is an absolute disgrace. Yeah. No, but if, you know what? That doesn't actually surprise me. Though. It doesn't surprise yeah. me. But you know, I just think you it's know, sad it, that that's the yeah, world that we live in. It is. It there is. is. It's all to the same end. Absolutely, and we're, we're all actually everybody's on the same side. Yeah. You know, uh, and and if we all worked a little bit close together, but no, it was. So who well, did you end up working with in order I to? Do, get I, I can't remember. I've, um, Simon set the whole thing up for us, and uh, you you got you managed to get the money there, and got the money there. The, the hardest thing was that there is no procedure in place to take a firearm in a uh, rifle into India because no one does it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So we wrote to, uh, we tried everything uh, uh, one year in advance, and um, uh, we got the permit the day before we flew. Someone must have been sweating somewhere. Yes, <laughs> actually, you probably. We, yeah, we actually had time. we had somebody camping outside the the embassy in London and uh, with the rifle, and he actually managed to get into the. Uh, I, I'm, I can't tell you who, whose office it was, and, pre and presented it, and the guy signed a letter. So <laughs> Simon and I land in. We got in. We got the rifle insured, but we you can't replace something no, like it's, that. It's no, sacred, yeah. you know. Um, and the people of India still see it as a sacred object. Yeah, and I'll yeah. talk about that in just a moment. But when we landed in Delhi. As we approach custom, it's always a nervous thing. Even, <laughs> guns, Even when everything's squared away, yeah, it's and, a and, we've, thing. and all we've got is a letter by, from some guy in in London, and we um, we uh, we approach uh, the you know customs hall, and I said to Simon, we might just um, in a minute become the two guys that lost the Corbett rifle. You know, got chopped up in Indian customs, and we the guy sort of uh, says, yeah, you know, what's this? I said, it's a firearm. His eyes, you know, then there's next minute there's like 20 guys. I pull the letter out. I don't know who that guy was. I don't know what it said on the letter, but we were immediately let through. That, just like that? Just like that. So yeah. you obviously got the right person there. They didn't even check the firearm. <laughs> no. I'm deadly serious. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it was crazy, but um, no, it's a, yeah. it, it, it is amazing though, in in what esteem the people of those yes. places still hold Jim Corbett. It's still uh, taught in the national curriculum. His stories. Um, he's, uh, you know, I wouldn't say he's godlike, but at some form but he's a hero deity. figure though. He, definitely, definitely, and we. Um, at the Ruda Prague Manita site, uh, there's still a statue there commemorating this, and it's on the Pilgrim Trail on, at the Ganges River. And we uh, we were told that the local people wanted to have a ceremony for us, so we turned up. And you know, the, 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 these people aren't particularly well off, but they'd really spent some time, and and they built they directed this huge sort of marquee with fabulous. Um, sort of silk uh, drapes of all different colours and th there were flowers everywhere. There were, I think, 100, 150 children from the local school. I don't know. There were hundreds, maybe thousands of people turned up for this thing. There was the local judge, the local colonel from the same regiment that Jim Corbett was part of. And we, um, I was given the honour of actually presenting the rifle onto the, um, on, placing it on the statue. Wow. And uh, I was asked to, you know, remove my shoes and, you know, put flowers on. It was like National Geographic type stuff. Mm. It was just incredible. And and people were, you know, desperate to touch the gun and they were crying. And you actually still saw... It actually it must it be real. relatives of people Definitely, that he, who you know, had died. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, we, when you're, you know, as a 12-year-old boy sat in West Sussex reading Jim Corbett, you know, it feels it's all very exciting and, you know, guys getting carried off in the night <laughs> by this le man-eating leopard. But when you're there and you meet, you know, guy says, yeah, my father was killed, you know, the 80 year old man yeah my father was taken out from and that was what's so scary about that man eater is that it, they didn't take you when you're out in the fields it would actually sort of dig under the door and drag you out of your bed at night it was, you know, the people were terrified so um yeah I, I think it really reinforced how much of a local and national hero he is in india oh, it, it's, a, it's a great great story and as we get to wrapping up a very very open question for you but the future of rugby is looking bright, but what is there anything that you can actually tell us that isn't secret? <laughs> well, there, <laughs> that's there, coming up. There, well, there is a secret uh, project, and uh, like all things in the British gun trade, it's the worst kept secret okay. out there. Everyone knows about <laughs> it. Um, for those of you who are listening who do know, uh, you know, there may or may not be a shotgun that comes out before the end of the decade. You know, I, I couldn't possibly say, <laughs> but uh, we you know, we've got a pretty uh, exciting project in the background. Um, there'll be some news on that in January, February next year. Right. So, yeah. Mark, it's been great to speak to you again today. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your time. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Lisa, welcome to the podcast. We've been trying to get you on now for, I don't know, how long? Uh, two, two years. years. <laughs> two years. <laughs> two years almost. Two years yeah. now. And it's actually ridiculous that we haven't got you on the show, considering how much time we've actually spent with <laughs> yeah. you over the last two years. In uh, all the different countries. Uh, how we, I think we worked out. How many different countries have we travelled uh, together? Well, there? Norway, uh, Scotland, yeah. of course. Germany. Uh, Germany, Finland. Finland. I'm sure we have one. That's well, in the space of like 12 months, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and and in the following week we're going to be in Svalbard, not actually together because it was never planned. No, but you're going to be there at the same time. And then the following month I'm actually coming to My very house. far north. Yeah, and we're going to to your house. Is it actually going to be light? Is it going to be light in Norway? Yeah, by the time yeah. Darryl gets we have there. daylight now, but yeah. in January it would be horrendous to be there. You wouldn't see anything. What is it like? Half an hour, one hour light? Oh, it's it's half an hour of like bluish light. It's not light. That, light. that is you why don't see I decided the to come then because I just thought I want to come up north and see mm. everything, but it, I'm sure it's beautiful in winter. But, yeah. <laughs> Which you see imagine shit. that you're like, you land at the airport <laughs> and you see nothing for the entire week. <laughs> you just go <laughs> leave in the dark. Yeah, leave in the dark. <laughs> I should just explain that just before we continue. We're, we're sitting on the Browning stand, and the tink, 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 tink you can hear in the background is a lady engraving an action and she's been doing it all weekend. Yeah, it's uh, beautiful. So that's you, it's yeah. incredible. When, when you see that that's how it's done yeah. with, with essentially a little chisel and a little yeah. hammer, it's incredible. Y you have no idea. And it's freehand, yeah. freehand. And you know what? I visited the, um, the gun shop that makes the B-15 and B-25 uh, in Herstal and they do everything by I have a B25. hand. You have? Yeah. Seriously, how much did you pay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I would used to, used to have. Uh, yeah. uh, it's amazing. You have no idea that how skilled they are, yeah. the workers at the factory. It's, it's nice to be able to see it, actually. Yeah. Anyway, 
Uh, that was just to explain what on earth uh, the noise was. <laughs> quite a few of our listeners probably know who you are through social media and if they follow us, which mm-hmm. obviously our listeners probably do follow us, um, <laughs> they would have seen you on our Instagram account and then on the film that we did in Norway. And one of the reasons why we wanted to get you on particularly is because we wanted to find out about your background and how it, how it kind of started because this isn't a new thing for you hunting. This is no. this has gone... Well, you start start from the beginning. What, what age did you first pick up a r- rifle? Um, I'm not sure, but I think I was maybe f- five years old. So I really sh- old then. Uh, yeah, yeah, really <laughs> yeah. old. Uh, when when I shot my uh, granddad's pistol, and then pretty much the same age, we had a U.S. carbine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I shot that, and I mean, I had an air gun. In my bedroom, my girl room, like you just grew up with that. Yeah, and uh, my dad took me hunting. My mom took me hunting from a very, very young age. So because both your mom and your dad hunt. Yeah, yeah. I think my mom hunts more. You think <laughs> so? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a fairly unusual thing, still. Yeah. Yeah. We do that as a family activity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what what kind of hunting? Because um, it's quite different what you guys do in Yeah, in we Norway. have moose hunting. Uh, so we do that as a team with the other locals. Um, and the meat gets shared out between the, yeah. the people that are yeah. there. Yeah, you have meat according to size of the property. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Because a, a, a moose is a big animal. So you're probably not going to be able is, to consume yeah. the whole thing yourself anyway. You have basically meat f- almost for the whole winter with the whole moose if huh. you would eat it once a week, twice a week, yeah. So is that predominantly the the food of choice? As in, during winter, you mainly eat what you've killed from the previous season? Yeah. Yeah. She says it like that's no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> but for so many people, that's just not normal. No. <laughs> and we also know that you are big into grouse shooting. Yeah. That was uh, initially what I started out hunting yeah. and... I actually bought my first hunting dog when I was 14 years old, so... And you, compete, uh, English you, you competed? Yeah, uh, I did. You, do you still compete? No. No, you're not. No. H- it's how a do difficult you world. Uh, my dog got neutered, so he can't compete anymore. Was that the stipulation? And it was worthless anyways. Ball, it was the dog needs balls Yeah, he does, really? it does. Yeah, because it, it's for breeding that you uh, want uh, oh, okay. Got you. a prize. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would explain the competition to me, because I, I don't... This is... Pointer competitions. Well, you have like 20 dogs and 20 people go out in the mountain and you uh, let two dogs out at the same time and they hunt like in a normal situation. Only you don't have a shotgun, you have a... uh, Clipboard. Yeah. (laughs) And mark them. Yeah, and a starter pistol. Is that the name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you do it basically like you would on a walked up grouse hunt. And then you've got somebody and they just basically judge how well your, your, your dog, dog has performs, executed it. Your dog performs, yeah. Huh. It should be on point and it should flush the bird and then it should sit down. <laughs> and not chase after the bird. If it chases, chases after, Instant you can... done. Yeah. So none of our dogs would... Uh, no, 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 no. Chasing saw, is bad. <laughs> I saw a picture of your dog the other day in like almost like a full onesie with boots. But mm-hmm. they need it, you need it. Well, I mean, what, what temperature have you had over the winter where you live? It's been really cold. Actually, it's been, I think, the coldest. My mom and me, we drove to Sweden one day and I think we had like 34 minus degrees. That's, that's crazy. That's seriously cold. Yeah. I don't even know how you operate in temperatures like that. Just to give people an idea of uh, where Elise lives, you have you have the midnight sun in summer, yeah. and then you also in winter it's the, the zero pitch black. pitch black for 24 yeah. hours of the day. We have the northern light though, so that is true. <laughs> that that does somewhat make up for it. It yeah. does. The northern <laughs> lights are spectacular. Yeah, they are. Now we want to talk because um, we don't have a huge amount of time with you, so we no. need to get you on again so we can go into a lot more detail. This thing. We want to talk about Scotland. The oh. first time you came over and uh, you came on our first wilderness um, hunt with us. Yeah. And you were helping us out with that. And so kind of describe, this was your first time in Scotland and also seeing the numbers of deer that you saw. It, it was amazing. It was mind-blowing for me because we can, in Norway, you can go like two, three days and don't see any animals. 
and to come there and see the amount of deer, even though it was hard to s stalk them, and but it just to see the big herds, uh, amazing. The gamekeepers do a fabulous job. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it where we where we took you up a, up at Glenfiddich is a uh, is a pretty it's special John's place. place. Well. Yeah, John's mm. place. It's. Um, Explain that that ex the experience to us. But for I mean, some of our podcast listeners have heard us talk about those hunts, the wilderness hunts, because we've just mm -hmm. finished a few now. But tell that talk about that experience from your point of view, from being there, because you were on the very first one we ever. Yeah, did. I was. Yeah. Even put the tent up with you. Yeah, you did. We got you to graft and help take it yeah. down. <laughs> but you built the best toilet. <laughs> I, I did. Yes. Yeah. You know that we have. He was a, so satisfied you know with a, that yeah. toilet. <laughs> There's now a Mark II toilet, which is, is a full wooden seat. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, it's proper, and you, it's it's like the right height and everything. Oh no! And you have a system for not. Well, we ha we had to camp in a slightly different location this year <laughs> because there was so much snow. Oh. We couldn't we couldn't physically. You know, so oh well, when you were there, we had to do we have to take a long way around. Yes, at least it was there. We did because the ones yeah. the road was blocked. Yeah. Well, there was so much snow we couldn't even get to that camp this time. Oh. So uh, we had uh, like an old shed that was sort of beside where we were camping. So behind the shed is where the toilet was okay. in the open again. Yeah. So we had a system to make sure nobody walked in. Oh, <laughs> 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 no, it was a raw experience. It's like back to nature. Uh, I really liked staying out. Mm. in the tent and having a wood fire stove and eat what you shoot and that's one that's one of the and things and I love we were that. we were outnumbered by scandinavians on the first yeah completely, completely. yeah I mean, you two got swedish you and two norwegians <laughs> two norwegians yeah it two was swedish swedish guys and two norwegian girls yeah yeah and hopefully well i think everyone's going to be coming back to do do more hunting with yeah, us we the two brothers have. wanted to come this year but we just couldn't make the no. make the make the dates oh it's an experience for a, a lifetime going there it's what was the the day that you actually shot your your deer which was your first red deer right yeah that was on our last day on our last day and then no, it wasn't actually the last day no. but it was mine and yours last day because oh, we that was were breaking down the camp we were walking all day i don't know how far we could have walked you were doing some 20 big days Ks? oh it was big days and on top of that it was the end of the day because we thought we were yeah was it was it. the last daylight and we had crawled um oh the word um what through the uh, what's the, the the black oh the peat, peat bogs peat bogs mm. yeah, yes yeah. <laughs> all day I and we've you seen her that, but we couldn't it's not exactly a common thing is it a peat bog yeah peat bog <laughs> I, well I was explaining to some Norwegian what it was, but... I you couldn't quite get there. No. It's a weird thing because when you're walking through it, it feels like you're on the moon. Yeah. Because it's so uh, bouncy. Yeah, it is. It's really cool. So anyway, carry on with I your... Carry on, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so it was the last daylight. I, I don't think I w we just came up a hill and then saw them and I had basically a few seconds to shoot. Because they saw us. Yeah. So they started running. And it was quite a big distance from us to them. We were, we were lucky that they started running. It was such a big herd yeah. that the ones at the back all mm -hmm. stopped yeah. and started to look at us again. And that was the, you know, the, the opportunity. That was the you, moment. You know you've got, yeah. you've got 10, 20 seconds Before. there. And, yeah. if, and if you don't take it there, that's it. It's, it's I think done. that was the gamekeeper's uh, earning because he made a sound. Yeah, he, he called, yeah. Stop he called yeah. them yeah, to stop. see if it would work and they stopped dead in their tracks. Yeah. The all ones at the back. Yeah. yeah. And then, but you only get a very small window at that oh. point before yeah. they work it out. Yeah. But you took it. Yeah, I took it. Yeah. And it was amazing. And uh, I obviously wasn't with you when on that. No, I walked that, up to it hunt. and the sun was going down behind us and the, the light. The pictures that Daryl took of of oh. that around there while you were you know just enjoying the moment are fantastic yeah. as well and do capture a little bit I had a, a quiet bit moment mm. with the deer yeah. just taking it all in it was amazing uh, that was your first red deer yeah and now since then you've actually shot a quite a few more yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've been very successful yeah after that so well on you go you're going to no, say no something. no no Carol, mm -hmm. Carol. I was going to say it's in the last two years since we've known you a mm -hmm. lot has moved on and, and changed with with you you're yeah. now you're now uh, a working working woman <laughs> yeah i am <laughs> when I'm we for, when we first met you you were a student bum <laughs> yep just hunting my way through life <laughs> yeah. 
it's not a bad way to go. But no. explain what you, explain what your job role is now, because you, I mean you're in the industry. I mean, how cool is that? Yeah, I love it. Um, I fit right in, don't I? You do. Uh, well, uh, my main job is to be a sales rep uh, for Browning Norway, and um, so we do a lot of game fairs and I visit shops. So that's what I'm doing in Svalbard. I'm vis- visiting Longyear, a shop there. And, and we'll uh, see you there. And we'll see you there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then I do some social media marketing for Browning Norway. To, be invo- to have a job in, the industry, in an industry that you are also passionate about is, is yeah. the ultimate, really. And the, the we funny always feel very lucky that we managed to do it. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is, when I was offered this job, my rifle was a Browning x I know, because it was the same one that you had from the day yes, one. Yeah. Yes, with the KKC stock on. It's yeah. I love the Browning. <laughs> uh, we oh, sorry, you go. Oh, no, we keep I, interrupting I, each other here. I was yeah. just going to ask her if she's got any hunting planned for uh, the rest yeah. of this year. Well, any, like, we're trying excursion. to book a trip to Africa. Yeah, well, that, 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 that is on the cards. Yeah. Right. That's, it's a little bit up in the air, but uh, yeah, you might very well be... C- we might be hunting together in Africa, which would be yeah. that's on no- another level. Another location around the world. Yeah. yeah. But apart from that... Uh, apart from that, I'm, I'm invited with... Um, uh, one of our ambassadors, his name is Yuad. Uh, you should meet him actually because you would love him. He uh, has a catering business and what he serves is the meat he shot. Oh, wow. Wow. So he has a lot of deer to shoot. Where's, where's he based? Uh, Songdal. So it's in this more southern part of Norway. So it's a flight for me. When I saw you last, it was, I was there. It was two days before I fell down a hole and yeah. my trousers got destroyed, which I was very upset oh, about. Yeah. I uh, will send you new ones, I <laughs> promise. If I have the size, I will send you new ones. Um, but when I was there, I met Jens. Mm-hmm. And Jens has been doing some really cool things. Unfortunately, we can't read all the things <laughs> that he Maybe you can give us an no. update. So can you tell us <laughs> he, exactly what he's he actually doing right now? He is actually now out uh, far up north in Norway, alone staying in the tent, hunting, and he's driving uh, sled dogs, with yeah. sled dogs, uh, from, uh, I think, uh, Finnmark, to his home place, with, which is in the middle of Norway, Tundlag. And he's doing that mid-winter, he got frostbites, he oh, really? nearly destroyed his fingers. Oh, wow. He's, he's but what's he guy. doing it for? Is it for a pro TV? Yeah. 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 Because Jens, over, I mean, over the last year... He uh, had it, a TV show he, where yeah. he stayed out a few months. So he had the TV show, yeah. and I saw he's won a few awards for, I think, that, yeah. that show. Yeah. Um, it's just so annoying that we can't understand what... Because all the on? stuff he puts up, and it's like, I, I can see that you've done something, which is cool, but Don't it's all in Norwegian. Don't Instagram translate it? It does, but it doesn't it's always work that well. No. And all, quite often it's articles that he, he posts that yeah. obviously someone else, and that's and all he can't it, translate. Yeah. And it's the films I'm talking about. Yeah. You can't translate that. No. Very cool. You're going to have to try and hook up a hunting trip with him. Yeah. She has. You've been hunting with him. I've been hunting oh, with have? him, yeah. That's where I shot the two deer in ah, October. Okay. I didn't realize yeah. that. We were there getting fat. You are makes the best food ever. <laughs> was that, I mean was that the, the, the guy that had that amazing house with all yes, of the, the mounts? Yes. Oh, I know who you're talking about now. Yeah. You should meet him. I mean, it is. And such a passionate hunter. We yeah. were hunting from 6 o'clock in the morning to, well, past the last daylight. <laughs> <laughs> Every day. Yeah. We want to talk a little bit about um, social media and actually the perception of hunting within Norway and how it's changed over the last few years and particularly women, more women and younger girls getting into hunting. Yeah, I think it, there is a development. We have an increased number of female hunters. So that's good. It's We have had female hunters before, but it's I think it's going upwards now. Mm-hmm. We have a few good ambassadors in Norway for hunting. Uh, as um, as a culture, though, I mean, mm-hmm. hunting's always been been there. But d- did you s- have you seen a drop off or more people kind of against it in Norway? Has it always kind of been it's an accepted thing to uh, to do? It has always been a part of our culture, yeah. pretty much. But there is, um, for instance, if you shoot a fox, which is a predator, 
and it eats the grouse, and we have a short, shorter of shortage of grouse. Shortage of grass, yeah. yeah. Difficult word. Uh, if you shoot that and p put it on social media, you will get some nasty comments. Hmm. Yeah. Because they're cute to look at, and but it, it is a part of hunting to take care of every aspect of it, also the predators. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you. I don't. It doesn't seem from the outside like you have to face uh, quite as much um, criticism not, not from as the general much public as, as the UK. I've, I follow Rachel Carey. Yeah, I. S she gets a lot. Yeah. yeah. I, I suppose that is just the shift in the in the, in the cultures there. Because even when we were driving through Daryl, remember the it was like opening day of moose season. Oh, just and just mm. everywhere we turned, there, there was, was just groups of people go, going out hunting mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah, it's every a family activity. We it's yeah. we've been been fishing and hunting forever. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, ice fishing. It's yeah. something that <laughs> that hopefully we can do when yeah. I am there. Um, but for the people that have not done it, can you explain actually what what is involved in ice fishing? Obviously, you need to be in a country where the, the lakes freeze over. Yeah. Uh, but explain how it works. Well, you just. Uh, you say you just. I mean, <laughs> it's not something that. Yeah, a you lot of people just. Yeah. Take your skis on. You ski to a lake. Yeah. You hope the ice is safe, <laughs> and you drill a hole in the ice, and then you have like a short. Um, we call it a pilk. Like a little fishing rod. A fishing rod. Yeah. It's like uh, and super short, like one foot long. Yeah, and yeah. you put the maggots on the hook, and you would want to stick it in the eye so it wiggles a lot. <laughs> and you have a light, a tiny light on it, and a, like a spoon. We call it a shea. Yeah. And sit there. But you, you like jig it enjoy. up and down. You jig it a bit up and down. How deep is it? Like where? I mean, how? What? Different depths. Is, is it just kind of, do you know the lakes that you go to? So you're like, I want to go and fish this edge of it? Or yeah. are you just randomly selecting places? I pretty much know where the big fish is okay. and when the small fish is. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but if you're staying there for longer, you bring a tent and, and a heater. and Yeah, you yeah. can do that. We don't do that. We no, you're hardcore and you just stay outside. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you catching? Norwegian dust freeze them. <laughs> what, what? what type of it is it? Uh, Arctic, Arctic char. char yeah. mostly. Any, anything else? Pike? Um, well, we don't have pike, but if you go a bit further f south... You get pike. Yeah. yeah. I've never caught an Arctic char. You didn't? No. Well, we we have Arctic char in Scotland, yeah. but only in certain lakes, only the very deepest lakes. Yeah. And they're way down deep. So unless you're actually fishing for them, mm -hmm. it's not normal Is to that catch because them. they like the cold? Um, I don't want to say yes to yeah. that question, but maybe. Uh, no, it's, it's just they're, they're obviously to. catching it near the surface, but it's the whole lake is freezing cold. So yeah, I'm, mm. I'm not sure. But they do but come up in um, even at Loch Lee near us mm. in May when they're spawning. Mm. Yeah. They come up to the surface, and that's when guys do catch them mm. when they're out trout fishing. But mm -hmm. um, so I've never caught one, so it is yeah. high on my list. So in Sweden, you can drive with a snowmobile from lake to lake and just fish for a few hours and then move to another lake and then fish for a few hours. You don't hours. have to pay for it? It's, is it free Well, you access pay for it, but it's like, can be about seven pounds a day. But is that to the government or are yeah. these private lakes? Uh, it's, it, it depends, it okay. depends. Yeah, but it's, it's, not ex it's not expensive. It's not it's expensive. It's pretty free and available. Yeah. yeah, you can fish as much as you want. I've seen uh, a friend of uh, mine who is in Sweden. I've seen some pictures of him catching monster grayling mm -hmm. in some of the rivers there. Mm -hmm. Do you have grayling in the Norwegian river? Uh, as well? I'm not sure what it grayling. No. It's like a, it's a gray fish actually, mm -hmm. with a uh, with a red dorsal fin, and uh, I don't know how to describe it, but yeah, they've got them in Sweden certainly. Yeah. Big grayling compared to what we have. But I've, we've, we did, we did a little bit of sea fishing in Norway when we were there, we did. but mm. nothing inland. Oh, and that was horrendous. For you, you were, yeah. you were very ill. You were looking extraordinarily ill. I think I was green yeah. at one no, point. No, you, you weren't green. Mike was green. Uh, yeah. I, I've, I've spent many years <laughs> on the sea, many years on the sea, and I got seasick myself. And yeah. I knew a few other people in the Navy that got seasick. And um, I never, s you know, you, you, f you have the phrase, oh, you're looking a bit green. Yeah. And I never saw that until we went to Norway and mm -hmm. one of the Americans <laughs> that was with us literally turned green. <laughs> and, and that's the first time I've ever seen someone. Because normally you just go white. Mm -hmm. 
and you don't go green. <laughs> this, this dude was green. <laughs> <laughs> he was upset. It was a shame because it was. It and was, I it gave was a him nice a day. seasickness. I was uh, too late. Tablet. It yeah. was too late by then. Yeah. You and you gave me that. That was also too patch. late. Oh my god. That was also too late by then. You got to load up before. You, you got to do it before. Mm-hmm. You got to be doing it an hour before. You, you do it. Daryl's well practiced. I'm well practiced. <laughs> mm-hmm. I used to be like a junkie on my ship. Yeah. <laughs> trying to get my next fix of seasick oh. thickness tablets. But and that, then I got the patches and that. The that, patch. The patch. No, the patch everything. was horrendous. My mouth was like cotton <laughs> <laughs> for days. That, that's the problem with. Uh, I mean, I couldn't swallow anything, not food, anything for days. If anyone. Um, as never heard, you can actually get seasickness patches that are fully waterproof, and you shove them on they're behind your ear, and they last three days. Yeah. And uh, I had them. Um, I got issued them in Germany for the first time, and then I managed to get some more from New Zealand. And in the UK, apparently, it's quite hard to get hold of them. And these things, they solved all my problems, but the. I've lost Sorry. my train of thought. I, I just tracking, I'll tell you why. Because the guys from from uh, from Hooked, and you're in Norway, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, t- we're taking some pictures, and I knew that we would do them some podcast stickers. So I, uh. while you were talking, I was just telling them to come over so I could get them some podcast stickers. <laughs> I, I, back to my... I've, See you guys. Yeah. Talk I, to you later. I remember my train of thought now. Mm-hmm. The problem with these patches is the list of side effects is about three pages long. Yeah. And I threw that in the bin because I was like, I, the, the top ones were uh, dry mouth. Mm-hmm. And then actually the side effects for women were, was worse than it was for men. And um, my, the only one I got was a dry mouth and I just learned to live with it. But yeah, you... Dry uh, mouth is the is, understatement is like, of it's the with, year. It's within 15 minutes your yeah, mouth just goes like the Sahara <laughs> <Sorry>. Desert. <laughs> See, that's what problems when you're, coming when, you're, out of it. when you're just made weak because I, I don't have to take anything for the sea. Oh, <laughs> oh that was Luckily. horrendous. Luckily. But we did catch some fish. You and caught we, a big mm, fish. I did. Yeah. I caught the biggest fish of the trip. But the funny thing is, like a few weeks prior to that boat trip, I took my boat driver's license. You have to take a license yeah. to drive a boat in Norway. So I took that a few weeks before. But you, you've had no desire to go <laughs> no, take a boat No, 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 no. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Stick to frozen lakes. Yep. Boat not required. <laughs> no. Uh, so how was the hunting season that's just passed for you? Uh, it's been good. but uh, I know you've been really busy. I've been really busy. I've been traveling a lot and working. But I had um, a week off filming for Browning Norway with Jens. Yeah. So we were up in the mountains hunting grouse and a duck. <laughs> Shot a duck. Yep. Had to swim. <laughs> well... So we were also doing the same as the wilderness hunt. Mm-hmm. Didn't bring too much food. Ate what we shot. So, That's and then I had uh, a newspaper with me, uh, Dog and Snaring Sleeve. It's a big uh, Norwegian uh, I newspaper. Saw the, I saw the. I think you took pictures online. I saw the article. Obviously, I didn't read it. No. Um. It's actually a, like a financial newspaper, but they do like sporting section hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. So what was what was that story about? It's about grouse hunting, and then they're doing another article uh, that comes this fall about uh, me and my social media accounts and oh, cool. story. And uh, because my hunting ground was owned by my great 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 grandparents, and it's been in the family a lot for of generations. generations. And the only yes. way to get access to it is to marry you. Yep, <laughs> basically. <laughs> if you want to contact me, so <laughs> you can find us. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> Friends as well. That's why we keep yeah. you around. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, we want to talk a little bit about the film that mm-hmm. we made in Norway two years ago now. Yeah. Basically two years. Um, Has that it been it, that long? I, I can't even remember Have an age thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that we're talking about the one that's entered in the film festival that is still currently going around the mm-hmm. United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, I... We tell people it was bloody hard work. Yeah. You were there. You were helping us carrying the equipment up and down the mountains. I mean, you I you almost lit. cried one the one day we were up in the mountains. My legs stopped working, yeah, so Lisa had, had to carry my pack, and I we swapped packs. It was ridiculous because the, the pack, pack was, was bigger, bigger, bigger than her. <laughs> yeah. It must have been it was about down 50 a kgs. Steep, 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 steep mountain, and I, I weigh fifty. Kilos, so <laughs> <laughs> that backpack <laughs> weighed about 50 kilos, if not more. Yeah, what the steep parts I just had to slide down yeah. because I couldn't, I couldn't keep my back up. I actually can't believe we walked up there with that no. amount of equipment. It was, it's pretty. But crazy. we had to carry every. But we did. I mean, 
what we saw and what we took pictures of and what we captured. It was amazing. Was worth it in the end. It was amazing. I've almost, I, I guess, uh, it's probably a bit like childbirth. I've almost forgotten how painful it was to do all of that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, let's go we do it again. We lost a few kilos. Yeah, we yeah. did. Yeah, too, right. I put it all back on again <laughs> yeah. since my legs stopped working. Oh. Um, but yeah, can you tell people how how tough some of this it was terrain was? Bloody there? hard. Uh, it was. I mean. I almost killed you, Byron. It did. Massive rock. Oh, yeah, you Massive did. I, rock. I, I yeah. had forgotten about it and forgiven you. But now that you've reminded <laughs> me, <laughs> you've got to be so I'm careful. I'm so sorry. I'm still it. sorry. <laughs> it was a very dangerous environment it in was. some places because the valley that we went up, in fact, it was the yeah. us again. We went up that. Several, I actually saw a documentary about it. Several people have died up in that valley. Really? Yeah. But so that, that was. It's just the loose rocks. Yeah. Have they, are, they oh, launching, yeah, are they launching something behind us? There's a cocktail us, party going on. Or is it on just a cocktail party? And the music. They I think it's something. a launch and a cocktail party. Well, there's lots of people in cowboy hats yeah. next to us. So I think and they've, Raniero they, is there Testa is there. Yes, Raniero Testa is there I, I noticed you work for Browning and we didn't get an invite. Well, yeah, where's our right invite now? to the cocktail party? <laughs> um, this is the time I invited you here. Oh, so specifically. Yeah, specifically this time. Um... Yeah, I've been very distracted by like the rock music now. <laughs> <laughs> and we've just actually just walked past us as a, an awesome you. photographer. Uh, yeah. an another man that was on yeah. the trip with us, he's walked, he's ignored us he's and walked yeah. past completely, us now. Completely mm -hmm. ignored us. Photographer extraordinaire. Oh, but it was a good experience. Yeah. But the house we were staying in for a few days, the the size of the bugs in that house, I never and the moist. That. Oh, it was yeah. It it wasn't really. It was, it was like house, somewhere between a house and a shack. Yeah, it was a shack. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think at some point in the past, it must have been lovely because it was actually a small yeah. farm there. Yeah. But it just, for years and years, no one living in it. But it, it, it fitted, you know, it, it did the job. Mm -hmm. Gave yeah. us uh, somewhere dry-ish to sleep. Yeah. We, it we wasn't were, raining on us. We were yeah. all a bit tired of the ration packs by the time we got to the end. Oh, I still eat them. No, I mean, only on that trip. Well, I think I think they're really, I think they're great. In yeah. fact, we need to find them this afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the real ration packs. But the problem is when you they eat them for weeks and yeah. weeks. Yeah. It's, uh, mm. It doesn't matter what you're eating. If you eat it for weeks and weeks, you're yeah. going to get... But they have different flavors. Yeah. But they brought out some new ones. I like the it. beef and the potato one, so... <laughs> you know that you're not supposed to keep them in your cupboard and eat them when you're just can't be bothered cooking all night, right? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Uh, it's the student going back to you. It's like it's like the equivalent of a pot noodle, isn't it? Is, it? Yeah. I think the really loud music behind us and yes. the launch is probably putting an end to uh, this this podcast. Mm -hmm. But thank you very much for coming on, and yeah, we're going to get you pleasure. on in a quieter environment so we can actually talk yes. into greater detail about your your upbringing and the hunting and go into greater depths and how the moose hunting works now because it's yeah. actually fascinating how the I logistics, think the, the dogs alone, the dogs is just and everything. An yeah. mm -hmm. I don't. Need, it, I don't understand how it's so bred into them that they just know what to do. I know that yeah. there's training involved, but oh, you a can't lot of just. Training. <laughs> but those dogs are incredible. Yeah. But yeah, we'll have to talk about that because I think the, the, they seem to be ramping the music up behind yeah. us. Yeah, they are. <laughs> They're trying to get us shut down over here, yeah. louder and louder. Uh, but thank you very much for coming on, yeah. and uh, it's a pleasure. We'll yeah. get you on again. I'll see you in a week, and then yep. I'll see you in two weeks after that <laughs> at your house. You'll be fed up with them by the time yeah. you get to the end of the month. And you and Beth have to come as well. We'll have to try and make a plan. Have to check your calendar. <laughs> if anyone doesn't follow you already, more <laughs> clapping. Uh, what's the best way to find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook, Villrupa. Yep. No one's going to be able to spell that. No. Nope. Uh, but you are on our, our, on our Instagram quite yeah. often, so we'll when this goes out, we'll pop a, a post as well. Yeah, do that. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the show. I know I kind of did a outro in the beginning, but uh, as usual, we like to give you the, the spiel of where you can find us and uh, where to download us because we have new listeners all the time and there's sometimes always a better way to listen to the show. Um, I read the other day that there's actually been a small delay on some shows on Spotify updating, which hopefully that won't happen to ours, but um, if the show is late on Spotify, that'll be the reason why. Uh, we are on SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify that I just mentioned, of course, iTunes, Acast, Podbean. Uh, TuneIn Radio? 
we, we are also on TuneIn Radio. For some reason, the artwork hasn't updated on there, and I've emailed them twice, and they just went on real high back. I don't think many people listen to it on TuneIn. No, a very, very small number. But, I mean, th- we've got a huge range, and like we've said before, YouTube, that in the coming months, that's going to update. That There will actually be a uh, video there at some point as well. If you want to get in contact with us, it's podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. We read all of the emails, and we generally do reply to all of them, and if we don't reply straight away just uh, hold off a few days uh, because often we are out and about and uh, a little bit busy but sometimes it can take a week but I yeah. always make sure I put them aside so that I do get to them and normally I do them all in one go so yeah, exactly. we will get to them if you want to see any of our stuff or a little bit more about us then head to all the w's the pacebrothers.com uh, where you will find uh, what will you find on there it's just been updated you'll find, uh, you'll obviously find the shop the shop the bios yeah or the bios the background um, and you'll find some films yes you will that we've made and if you want to see more films that our production company has made uh, then yeah, I think there's actually a link that takes you to the, the production yeah there is a production company um, because we made uh a huge amount of films recently uh, that have gone out to some some kind of more educational ones that unless you're actually wanting to know about a topic you probably wouldn't find any uh, very useful uh, but some very good ones I'm not sure if I've, if I've mentioned them on the podcast before but the um, uh, Scottish Venison, Venison yeah, Partnership that's the one I was thinking of um, they have it's actually if you just look for Scottish Venison as a channel on YouTube you'll find three films that we made there and they were specifically made they're not gralicking how-tos or gutting i guess if you're in the in the states uh, uh, but they show how to minimize gross contamination so contamination from gut spillage and and feces in the pre- preparation of the carcasses and the reason that why they were made is that there was an e coli outbreak at one of the processing plants maybe two or three years ago now um, so a lot of organizations and game dealers came together to make these films so there's some educational films for you. And I must actually put the links up on our website as well, uh, but they're on YouTube. And if you've not seen the... In fact, this would be a good opportunity. If you have not seen the film, uh, the Rigby film for like the launch of the Highland Stalker that we were involved in, which is talked about in the show, then head over to YouTube and just type in, I think, just Highland Stalker, and it's the third or fourth film that comes up. It is also on the Rigby YouTube channel. Um, and it's... T- how many minutes long? Uh, I think it's nine minutes. Nine long. minutes long. Yeah. So there you go. You can watch it nine minutes, and uh, and then you get a little bit more context about what we were talking about. We should have mentioned that at the start. Probably Tell people the, to go and watch it. Probably uh, at the start, but then again, some people will split this in two. So yeah. you'll you'll enjoy it. Trust me. I'm just uh, looking at the table in front of us here, and I've noticed but I haven't read either of these yet. Our folks just came back from the states, and they dropped in two magazines to our office. One is Outdoor Life, which I am familiar with, and it's got I a think big picture of Jim Shockey in it. There. Oh yeah, that's, I, the, that's a cool cover. Then. It is cool. Yeah, it's, that was that was last month. Jim in the mountains holding a. Um, I think it's a nozzler, I think. Rifle, yeah, hold, yeah, holding his rifle. It's very cool. Good picture. It is a good picture. But I used to subscribe to that on my iPad, um, but this one that's sitting in front of me, ooh, it's got a really cool texture. It's the first time I picked it yeah, up. Yeah, this is one as well. They've yeah. got really nice textures to yeah. them. Uh, it's called Recoil, which I think is a little bit more um, probably self-defense type stuff. But the reason why I bring it up is I would be interested to know what you all like to read. Yeah, that would be quite interesting. Yeah, well, we've talked about Modern Huntsman, uh, and we mentioned it at the start. But what do you read in the kind of outdoor space? I mean, do it doesn't just anything? have to be yeah. It doesn't just have to be hunting magazines. I've started to read a lot of um, ecology papers and uh, and that kind of thing recently after having discussions with Charles Post, who's going to be on the podcast soon. Because um, um, I, so I've been, I've been I subscribe well. to more non-hunting magazines. I I've got four subscriptions to magazines, um, and well, one is National Geographic. Then there's men's fitness. I think it's men's health. No, men's health. I think it's men's health. What I really like about men's health isn't actually like the, the huge muscle things. It's actually don't lie. <laughs> they they actually do talk a lot of really cool stuff, especially about like endurance training, because they often have articles about you know really nails races around the world and mm. amazing locations. So it's quite a cool magazine. Then I also have Wired, and then there's another one as well, which is uh. Is it? You did sus- uh, oh, subscribe got, to photography. I've got a photography one as well. Um, I um, 
I recently just cancelled my subscription. If you're into filmmaking, I just recently cancelled my subscription to Digital Filmmaker. It was like a only available through iTunes. It was like 24 quid a year or something. And I, I subscribed them for over a year. And every single one had uh, was about a zombie movie. And I just had enough of... of it's quite uh, staggering. We, we've had... We, Daryl and I have had this discussion a couple of times. If you pick up a lot of filmmaking magazines, like off the shelf in the shops... There are so many people making zombie movies, and I just don't get it because the story is always the same, and it just makes you wonder whether people have a lack of imagination. I've never thought to myself when I've woken up in the morning, you know what we need to do as a production make a company to make a zombie film. Maybe they, maybe no one has done the angle of the zombie, the zombie like, hunter. How, how no? How does the zombie feel about being in the apocalypse? <laughs> I don't think. I don't think from the think zombie's that point of view. Uh, for another life. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening to the show. You'll hear from us again in two weeks' time. Yeah.